Hi, I'm Deborah. In this episode of the How to Sew video series, we are going to meet your machine. Whether you are brand new to sewing or whether you've been sewing for a long time, knowing the actual names, like the real names, for all the different parts of your machine is an essential skill. It simply makes communication easier so that when you're reading instructions or reading advice or when you have a question that you need to ask, you'll have the right vocabulary to be sure that the information you get is accurate and useful. Your sewing machine is probably the biggest tool that you will need for sewing. All sewing can be done by hand, using just a hand needle and thread, but a sewing machine makes it a lot faster and a lot easier, meaning that you can get experience getting great results sooner, which helps you build the confidence that you need to go out and make your next project. We're going to meet a couple different types of sewing machine because there are a lot of them out there. It isn't necessary for you to purchase a brand new machine in order to get started sewing. Lots of them are available at thrift stores and op shops near you, handed down from friends, at an estate sale around the corner, at a yard sale over the weekend. You can easily find a fantastic machine for $10 or less. We're going to look at two different types of machine up close. One is a mechanical machine, a manual sewing machine that does not have a computer in it. The other is a computerized machine. This is a classic Singer sewing machine. It's not even remotely the oldest machine I have ever owned or sewed on. I actually got this from a thrift store. Um, if you are in the UK or Australia, you might call that the op shop came complete with the table that it fits into. Um, and I think it cost me around $20, $25. So a great machine is really easy to get, very affordable for almost everyone. If you're willing to scrape together a few dollars, you can get started with a machine that quite frankly is so well-made, it will last you for years and years. We're going to begin our exploration of the parts of the sewing machine using this model because it is the most accessible and probably the most familiar to most of us. Before we move on to computerized models, which may be less familiar and have more features. When we look at your sewing machine, we're going to go through the major parts in the order that you will experience them as you are working with your machine. And that begins with your spool holder right here. For a lot of sewing machines, the spool holder is retractable. Even some of these older, heavier models, this one is made to be built into a table, will still have a retractable spool holder for storage so that it's not in danger of being um, damaged or broken off in any way. Other machines will have a secondary spool holder that comes off the side or that lies horizontal. This particular one is designed so that your spool goes onto it vertically. From there, the thread will go past a series of thread holders. These are different little springy, I think is the technical term, mechanisms that uh, manage the thread for you to prevent it from getting tangled. You'll go past a thread holder and to your tension mechanism. The tension mechanism in this machine, it's really great to be able to see an older machine like this because it helps you understand how sewing machine tension works. Behind this knob, which twists from zero all the way up to nine, there's zero and it goes all the way up to nine, are two discs. One is convex and one is concave and they articulate up against one another. The thread goes between those discs. So with less tension, the thread is more loosely held and with more tension, it's more tightly held. And that controls how much thread goes from the spool to the needle after you thread your machine. The tension that you place on the thread will control how snug the stitches are in the fabric. Different weights of fabric require different levels of tension. Different thicknesses of thread do as well. So it's really important to get to know your tension mechanism and be able to operate it. Next to the tension mechanism, there's usually a spring. This allows for some give between the thread guide and your tension mechanism as we head to the take-up lever. Now, if you look on the side of your machine, you're going to have a hand wheel here. That hand wheel turns towards you, towards you, towards you, always towards you, never away, because that's the direction that the mechanism inside the machine works. And can you see as I turn the hand wheel, it causes the take-up lever to go up, down, up, down, at the same time that the needle bar goes up, down, up, down. This take-up lever, if you imagine the thread going from here to here around this tension mechanism, next it comes to our take-up lever. 
And as the thread goes through the take-up lever, it increases and decreases the amount of slack. That keeps all of the tension on the thread nice and consistent as we go back through one more thread guide immediately above the needle and then through the needle itself. Unlike a hand sewing needle, the hole, the eye on a machine sewing needle is next to the point of the needle. And the point of the needle is oriented on most sewing machines front to back. Some older models, including Singer, will orient side to side, but in most of the modern sewing machines you'll encounter, the thread goes front to back. The needle is in a mechanism called the needle bar, and there's a small, a small screw here that is hand-operated. It'll have a notch in it for a screwdriver in case it's ever over-tightened, but a small screw there so that you can remove and replace your needle if it gets broken or when it gets dull, which it will do. Next to the needle bar behind it, at the back of your machine, almost all machines will have a hand-operated presser foot lever. This raises and lowers the presser foot so that it articulates against the feed dogs. Presser feet come in different styles depending on the type of sewing that you're doing. Most of us will be using a universal presser foot for the beginning sewing that we're doing. If you don't know the differences between presser feet and you purchased an older machine that's used, you're almost guaranteed to have only gotten the universal presser foot. Below the presser foot are feed dogs. And if you run your fingers over them, you'll feel they're like little teeth underneath the machine. And as you turn that hand wheel with your finger on the teeth, you'll notice that they move to the back, drop down, come forward, move up. Move to the back, drop down, come forward, move up. That is how the sewing machine moves fabric under the needle. The needle isn't moving. It's actually these feed dogs that are drawing the fabric under the machine as you sew. That means that when you're sewing, your hands are not there to push the fabric. They are there to guide it like you're steering a car. You're not Fred Flintstone running and making the car move. You're just steering it on the road and the engine is doing the work. Same thing with our sewing machine. Our job is to steer the fabric, but it's actually the machine that's doing the work. Surrounding your feed dogs is what's called the throat plate. The throat plate has a series of markings on it that indicate distance from the needle. If your machine was manufactured in the United States, those will be in eighths of an inch because that is the standard unit of measurement for American sewing. If you happen to have a European model, it will be in millimeters, usually in 10 millimeter increments. Next to the throat plate, you will have an opening. This particular one is a top load. Some will have a folding down door for a front load. This is where your bobbin is hidden. The bobbin is the other side of the thread. So you'll have thread coming down from the needle above the machine and up from the bobbin below the fabric so that you're making your stitches on both sides that connect in the center of the fabric for a really pretty look. Your stitches can be made in a variety of different styles. This particular machine allows us to go from straight to zigzag in a selection of more or less preset widths. By moving this lever across, we are telling the machine how far from center the needle should move each time it takes a stitch. So the movement of the fabric under the machine is consistent. And if I set it to a straight stitch, I'm telling it go zero from center as you sew. So the fabric goes under, it goes zero from center, and we get a straight row of stitches. But if I move it to a zigzag stitch, I'm telling the machine that as the fabric goes under, it should go side to side, which creates a zigzag effect on the fabric. You'll wanna use that for things like finishing off the edges of fabric so they don't unravel, or for making a buttonhole. We can also permanently indicate to the needle that we want it to move from center. I can move it all the way to the right, I can keep it centered, or I can move it all the way to the left. I would use these options for putting in things like zippers or piping, where I want my needle to be exceptionally close to my stitches at the edge of the fabric. I can also select from a series of preset stitches. Here I have the option to do zigzag stitches, knit stitches, staggered stitches, or a particular hem stitch. 
The fancier your machine is, the more stitch options you'll have, but that's not a reason for you to upgrade your machine. You will know it's time to upgrade your machine when one of two things happens. Either your machine stops working and can no longer be repaired inside your budget, or you are constantly looking for a specialty stitch that your machine will not perform. You have two other options when it comes to your stitching that are built into your machine. One is stitch length. A stitch length of zero means that when the needle moves up and down and the fabric passes beneath it, the needle does not go forward. That is to say, you're stitching in place. Everything over that is a slightly greater stitch length. On some machines like this, where the stitch length goes zero to four, those numbers are simply larger than zero. Other machines, in particular Japanese manufactured machines, these numbers actually mean something and indicate the length in millimeters of the stitch itself. So a four millimeter stitch is quite large as stitches go, and a one millimeter is quite small. For almost everyone, your default stitch length will be about 2.5 on any scale. And if you have a computerized machine, I can almost guarantee that when you turn your machine on, that is where the stitches default. You'll also have a button. Sometimes it's a lever that you raise and lower. This is your reverse stitch. It allows the machine to stop stitching. You press the reverse lever, you begin stitching again, and it sews backward. You can release it and it will begin to sew forward again. The reverse lever will be used on a regular basis for something called backstitching, which is like tying a knot, but you do it with the machine. Finally, almost every machine will have buttonhole options. This particular one is what's called a four-step buttonholer, which means it's got preset stitch selections that create each of the portions of a buttonhole simply by turning the wheel and telling it what step of the buttonhole you're on. The other options for buttonhole stitches, some machines will have what's called an automatic buttonholer. That's usually in a computerized machine where basically I will set it to a specialty stitch and say, make me a buttonhole, and it will make me a buttonhole, and I don't have to do anything else. Others will have a four-step buttonholer like this. Some will have what's called a one-step buttonholer where I put on a specialty presser foot and I set it to this stitch selection and it does a buttonhole. And my job is simply to pay attention to things. Or you could have a really vintage machine where the buttonhole is a zigzag stitch. And it's your job to know how to utilize each of the different stitch options in order to make a beautiful buttonhole. Naturally, your sewing machine has an electric cord which plugs into the wall to give it power, but it's also going to have a second cord that leads to the foot pedal. Your foot pedal is identical to a gas pedal in a gas-powered automobile in that it has a ramp for your foot and you press down, more pressure equals greater speed. I've watched a number of different new sewing students turn their presser foot around backward and try to operate it from this side. The problem with doing that isn't that it won't work, because it will. The problem with doing that is you have a lot less control. Can you see how when I put pressure here, it's a lot more difficult for me to go slowly. It's sort of uh, 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 kind of on off. But if I turn it around the way it was designed and I place my foot, imagine this is my foot, place my foot on it and press down, I have a lot more control over how the machine operates. The bobbin winder on this machine is just this little nubbin here that's actually operated by a completely separate motor. It pops into place with the bobbin on top, but it's important to remember that the thread for the bobbin goes through the thread guide before it gets to the bobbin winder. This has a little spring-loaded mechanism in it that causes the thread as you wind the bobbin to go up and down for even feeding on the bobbin itself. So don't skip this part. Remember as we talk about the different types of sewing machine that the full How to Sew video series on the League of Dressmakers includes a downloadable and printable PDF workbook that you can use to go along with each of these episodes for additional reference and information. We would love to have you find your team at the League and grow your sewing with us. This machine is a computerized machine. And when I turn it on with the power switch on the side, you'll notice that the computer screen 
comes to life. And it has some of the settings that we saw on the other machine, but they default on this machine because the computer chip is pre-programmed in that way. Ultimately though, it really works exactly the same way. We have a spool holder. This one actually has two. There's a horizontal spool holder here, so the thread can go on sideways. And then there's another vertical one that actually stores in the back. Some newer machines have a separate spool holder tucked away in a little storage compartment that slides onto the machine and it pops into a small hole on the top of your machine so that you can hold a second spool of thread. You might need that if you sew with a twin needle or you might just prefer vertical versus horizontal. From there, you have all the same parts. You have thread guides, you have a tension mechanism. In this case, it's what's called a lay-in tension mechanism. So you don't have discs that articulate against one another. The thread just bing, bing, pops inside the tension mechanism kind of invisibly, and you don't have to worry about making sure it articulates with the discs. It still has a take-up lever right here that goes up and down. It's a little bit masked on this model behind this flange that protects the tension mechanism. There are thread guides on the needle bar at the bottom. It still has a presser foot. There's a throat plate with feed dogs. There's a bobbin case. In this case, it is a front load bobbin. So when you reach in to pull out the bobbin case, which looks like this, the bobbin will come apart from the bobbin case and will need to be reinserted before the bobbin case is placed inside the machine. This machine also has an extension table that is removable to make more space for sewing small things like um, pant legs or sleeves or collars and cuffs. The big difference here, of course, is this computer. When I said that turning it on causes it to default to certain settings, mostly that's about the stitch width and the stitch length. The stitch width, again, indicates how far from center the needle moves as the fabric goes under the machine. So I can increase the stitch width up to five, or I can decrease it down to zero. The stitch length indicator is how much fabric goes under the needle before the needle pierces the fabric again. So I can increase it all the way up to five, I can decrease it all the way down to zero. Because this is a computerized machine, there's a clear button that resets everything to all the default settings. You'll notice this indicator here when I do the zigzag stitch is below the width indicator. That represents the needle position. I have a few more options for needle position with this machine than I did with the other machine where I can go further to the right or left of center. And again, when I hit the clear button, everything goes back to the machine defaults. I have specialty stitches that are built into the machine, and this is the big difference on a computerized model compared to a more vintage mechanized model, is that some of these stitches, zigzag and straight combinations, are pre-programmed in based on what they assume are the stitches you're going to use the most. It also has a pre-programmed buttonhole foot that interacts with a computerized buttonholer so that it can make a buttonhole in a single step. This machine has a knot feature that will tie a knot at the end of your thread when you finish each stitch, or you can use the reverse stitch here to sew forward, back, forward in order to reverse it. You can adjust your speed on this machine. So this sort of works as a, um, as a regulator that it establishes the maximum speed for your machine. Some models will have a little tortoise and a little hair to indicate maximum speed there. And I can set my machine so that it can permanently keep the needle up or down so that when I stop sewing, if I have set it to needle down, the needle will always finish in my fabric rather than up. Like the other machine, the bobbin winder here has a separate motor, but instead of pushing the bobbin winder toward the stop, the stop comes toward the bobbin winder. We still wanna go around the little nubbin though, because that allows our bobbin to wind easily. 
Just like on our older machine, the foot pedal on this machine is oriented like the gas pedal on a car. So you press down with the higher end away from you to get a nice gentle speed. All these features are really great, and quite frankly, this has been my go-to machine, my personal sewing machine for more than 10 years. But ultimately, it works exactly the same way as any other machine. It still has a power cord, it still has a foot pedal, it still stitches straight, it still stitches zigzags, it just has a few more options. Now that you've met all the parts of your sewing machine, take the time to go through and identify each of them on the machine that you'll be sewing on. If you're working on a borrowed machine, that's all right. We can still identify all of those parts so that as you work through each of the sewing projects, you'll be able to find those parts on your machine quickly and easily. And if you have a sewing machine that is older or that has not been serviced recently, one of my most popular videos on my YouTube channel ever is sewing machine maintenance. There are two different episodes. One is for top loading bobbins and one is for front loading bobbins. And you can choose the one that suits your machine best.